think it's sensitive. Okay, here we go. We're in the <coughs> five seconds of silence. Here we go. Welcome. You're listening to the Best of Investing, sponsored by Pacific Trade Exchange, your best in barter exchange. This is the show where we present valuable information about real estate, the financial markets, and other economic business of the day. For those of you listening for the first time, here is our format. A few guys sitting around a bar having drinks without the drinks, talking business with you, the audience listening in. I'm your host, Edward Brown, and I'm delighted to have as my co-host, Mark Honf of Pacific Private Money, California's fastest growing private lender, and Brian Burke of Praxis Capital. Our phone number is 888-912-1190. Write that number down, 888-912-1190, because you're going to use that number to answer the trivia questions for three vacations given away during each commercial break. That's right, we're giving away nine vacations during this show. The vacations are sponsored by Lighthouse Resort and Marina, located one hour northeast of San Francisco. And the vacations are free. Their only request, a $75 cleaning fee to cover housekeeping expenses. Uh, the website is lighthouse, the number four, fun.com. You can reach them at 916-777-5511 and check out their new sports bar opening up May 1st. All right, now today's trivia theme is The Wizard of Oz. Remember? I'll oh, get you my pretty and your little dog too. Okay, our website is bestofinvesting.com. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube by typing Best of Investing Radio Show. A uh, quick reminder again, World Wraps in Corner Madera is still giving our listeners a free smoothie with purchase of a wrapper bowl. If you mention the Best of Investing, go there for lunch today. Best wraps in town. And don't forget to mention the Best of Investing for your free smoothies. Now, today's special guest is Ken Winans, uh, who is president of Winans International, one of California's most respected investment advisors, who also writes for Forbes magazine. In fact, his research is so good that Princeton University and Fidelity Investments pay him for his research. Uh, Ken, uh, welcome to The Best of Investing, and you had a special honor recently. Tell our audience about that. It was quite interesting. You're in your office one day and you find out that you have been nominated uh, through uh, Barron's to be part of their best of best independent investment advisors council. And for you guys probably know that there's a big business to do in Sun Valley, Idaho every year and Davos, Switzerland. So this is for investment advisors, that kind of conference. It was a lot of fun to go and hear what uh, the survivors are doing because it was kind of like the last group left standing after what happened in 2008. What are the survivors? Yeah, going? I was going to ask the same question. <laughs> you know, really. it, it, it's interesting because it's actually not a bad environment. I mean, you have the markets are doing well, bonds are doing well, uh, REIT, real estate investment trusts have been on a tear really for the last couple of years. Uh, the only area that everybody's kind of looking at right now is, gosh, municipal bonds. Uh, with what happened in Stockton, are yeah, there other? And, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a bit like because uh, we get called all the time. What's the next shoe to come down? And by the way, I've heard Los Angeles. Well, and San Diego, San, San Diego, Diego that County that and yeah. City. I know Edwards heard me talk about this yeah. for a while. It's, I mean, effectively these cities are broke, and so it's how long will people keep giving them money to stay afloat? But when you start tinkering with things like obviously the November election, we know that our our buddies in Sacramento have some real surprises in store for us on the ballot. But then on top of that as well, it's uh, even things with the tax code. Uh, a lot of municipal bonds are no longer exempt from alternative minimum tax, which are exactly the kind of people who like to buy mini bonds. So sure, there's just a lot sure. of stuff going on. Yeah, also, you know, the thing is the, uh, the counties are not like the federal government. They can't just put more gasoline in the machine and crank out more money. I mean, they may have to get bailed out. Which, by the way, a lot of the audience doesn't know that uh, I got my start in quote, got my start in radio due to Ken, which, by the way, my wife can never <laughs> forgive you. But uh, uh -oh. that's beside the point. I, I better put the Kevlar vest on. When I leave, uh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ken, what is happening in in the stock market these days? I mean, other than Apple, what? Uh, but where's where's the where's the good news in, in stocks? A lot of them. Uh, in fact, uh, it, well, it, all the things that we're told are supposed to be bad for you actually are the things going real well uh, today. Yum Brands that you know better as Long John Silver's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Its stock hit a record yum. high. At Yum, you got it. Yum uh, believe it or not, tobacco stocks. Uh, British Tobacco has hit a record high. Uh, record, by the way. Record, record high. Forget making up ground lost since 2007. Mm. They're at record levels. So there are there are those companies that have managed to make money in this environment. And then we all know the story about uh, the disasters. I mean, certainly when you look at retail, there's re some retailers that are doing really well, and then there's retailers not doing well. So well, let me ask you: Is it uh, with regard to the yum yum stocks, as you said? Yum yum. <laughs> is, is it because of the? Uh, you think it's because of the, the economy being down so low that people decided to go the cheap route? Of, of food? 
I mean, what, what, do you, what do you attribute to? What do you think? It, it, this is where it gets interesting. You have some people that that have not been affected by this, believe it or not. There are the the one percenters, for lack of a better term, that are generally, yes, maybe their houses have lost some value, but they're not the people who went completely crazy with borrowing against their residences. They're doing fine. They have their jobs. I mean, when we hear all these terrible employment numbers, even in California, let's say that the unemployment rate is 12%. That means the opposite is true, that all those other people have jobs. Then you have the uh, folks that were what we call the middle class that are having to do more belt tightening. You're right. They're, they're going to go to a McDonald's or a Long John Silver's to go out to eat, or they're going to shop at a TJ Maxx. They're not going to shop at uh, one of the higher end stores. So there is definitely been a shift in things. But it, it also goes to say that it doesn't mean our economy is so diverse that there are always companies out there and products out there for anybody at any point in the uh, social economic sphere. I wonder if the hospitals are doing better because some of those food uh, places are not the most healthy places to eat. But uh, <laughs> well, well, then there's also the stress factor of people who are stressed out too that have to go to the hospital. So maybe they are doing pretty good. That's true. Well, a lot of the, uh, and of course, you know, if, if in fact Obamacare gets repealed, you have a lot of the medical companies that have a vested interest in having that uh, be repealed and, and go back to the so-called way things work. So talking about tech, you know, you, we were talking about, uh, Mark was mentioning uh, Apple. So Apple and Google stocks have had a lot of attention and obviously prices have gone really, really high. Is there still any money to be made in a play like that? With Apple, it's, it's really kind of funny. I have more talks with people about Apple and gold. I mean, I spend more time, and literally today, before I came over, just people call and say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm afraid the world's going to blow up, so I want to own Apple and gold. <laughs> I got to say, want to own yeah, and gold in the same Apple. category. Exactly. Is that no. a hedge against currency? Well, yeah. yeah, at least the computers are all, well, no, they won't work. Yeah. Well, well, you know, that, that's a whole different topic, but if you think about as empires change, in, in fact, a little trivia, if you think about uh, the defeated empires of World War II, i.e. Germany and Japan and Italy, what are the last vestiges of those empires that survived? The companies. Think about it. The, co the, the companies in Japan and Germany and Italy that were around way before the beginning of World War II were there after World War II, and they, they were major defense contractor for the Axis power. So isn't it funny that the companies have a way of surviving empires? They just have a way of, it, it's uh, my, my only philosophical thought for the day. But here's the thing. <laughs> that you, you have a situation where when people get emotionally attached to investment, you guys have seen this with properties, mm -hmm. how many times do you find somebody who says, I love my home, I yeah. love my apartment yeah. building. I, I, you know, I don't ever hear anybody say, I love my public storage locker, but you know, maybe somebody <laughs> does. But, but the point is, I, love what's but in it, I, I get concerned when we attach emotion to a stock. And, and I, in fact, I told some people, I said, there's probably some people that would adopt Apple as an extended member of their oh, family. Right, right. <laughs> but I've been around long enough to see that all, and hey, I own Apple. Apple's been, I've, I've, I've done well with it. My clients have done well with it. But I'm not in love with it. Every single one of these tech stocks has a point in time. For those of us who remember AOL, remember Microsoft, remember Yahoo. Sony. Re Sony, they all have their runs. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I, and you know, I, I wish Tim Cook the best. He's the new CEO who uh, took over for Steve Jobs. I wish him well. But there's something to be said about those entrepreneurial spirits. And I, you know, when Sam Walton died, and Walmart is not the company it was when Sam Walton was like, when Herb Kelleher ran Southwest Airlines, it's not the same as it is now. It's not to say they're doing poorly. It's just saying that you lose that flavor. And I'm, it will be interesting to see how Apple is in the post job. Well, I'm really waiting for the, uh, uh, my investment in the company that produced beta tapes to come back. No, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. That's not going to happen. No, that's, yeah. way, that's way Maybe, Should I switch over to VHS now? No. Okay. Maybe go in a time warp uh, or invent a time machine. <laughs> Ken, what about, uh, what about index investors? Do you have any advice for those guys? Cause they Extremely don't. careful. Uh, it's funny, I, I, a lot of people still subscribe to the buy and hold theory. And, I, and I'm just saying, look, I don't know how many more years of pain you have to take. You've had 12 <laughs> years of nothing. And Ouch. listen, I know you guys believe John Bogle is the, who's the founder of Vanguard and who's the big believer in buy and hold. But after two 50% corrections in the equity market, certainly the correction we've all seen in the housing market, if you are not now a believer of the idea that you have to, there's a point in time to take defensive action in your portfolio. Yeah, otherwise you still own buggy whip companies. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay, we're going to cut back, we're, excuse me, we're going to cut to our first commercial break. We're in the studio here with Ken Winans, president of Winans International. 
one of America's uh, most respected uh, and registered investment advisors. And here's our first uh, commercial break. Here's our first trivia question. Again, the theme is The Wizard of Oz. What was the message? These are going to be a little harder than your average. They're you know, always like, what's hard. the name of the dog, right? They're always okay. hard. Yeah, no, just, I know, because he, all he knows is NASCAR. Okay, what was the message the Wicked Witch of the West wrote in the sky? Do you remember that one? Okay, the first three no. callers with the correct answer want a free three day, two night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Remember, she takes her broom, she writes something in the sky, and That's all right. everyone, everyone looks in the sky. Mark's what, what like he knows, Yeah, he's, he's been around for a while. <laughs> okay, uh, and you want a free three day, two night stay at the, the Lighthouse Resort. Their website is lighthouseforfun.com. Call 888 912 1190. That's 888 912 1190 to answer this question. What was the message the Wicked Witch of the West wrote in the sky? 888-912-1190. Make sure to include your name, address, email address, and speak slowly and spell out your email address one letter at a time for us, please. And uh, before we get back, uh, or before we cut out, uh, I gotta say one thing about The Wizard of Oz, all right? There are two things about that movie that bug me. Do you remember when Dorothy is in the witch's castle and the witch tells her that as soon as the sand runs out of the hourglass that she's gonna die? I always wondered when the witch left as the glass, the, the sand was going down, why didn't she just turn it back over again? And when the witch comes back, you go, see, I guess I still have them 10 minutes to go, yeah. Okay, the other one was, uh, remember Glinda, the, the good witch tells her, uh, when she, you know, yeah, all you had to do was click your, your heels. He goes, why didn't you tell me that before? He goes, well, you wouldn't have believed me. And I would have said, yeah, try me. <laughs> of course I would have believed you. Okay, we will be right back. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. Great. Fun. Fun, huh? Absolutely. I like how big you can see the numbers. It's I know, nice right? Get some of these things you can Got some here for you. Yeah, Grandma. I know, exactly. Well, this is my little thing. Yeah. That I know, okay, when this gets to around eight or nine minutes, Edward's going to do this any minute. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, Edward's, uh, he's. It's, it's hey, that, was, that was probably your most flawless uh, intro you've done yet. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you get a little, you know, you, know, you yeah. usually have at least one tongue tie in there because that's, you're saying it really fast and trying to get a lot of it. There's a lot to say. Yeah, that, that was, was actually like yeah. flawless. I couldn't believe it. Because you know what? He sat down at home yesterday all day long, long and he did the thing over and over and over. That's and over. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all about practice. That's, that's, that's it. Well, he, you know, he's a baptism under fire. When you're having to do it yeah. live, yeah. you just say, look, you're going to just go with it. Yeah. I like live. You know, actually, I'm getting used oh. to this now. But um, yeah. if you're having so much this fun, then like you should pay it. us. There you go. That works. Oh, the boys don't know oh, what yes. we're looking at, of course. <laughs> I got. I, I, I always put a sticker. Okay, why did you just put your? Because <laughs> yeah. I put a sticker. I, I, I thought this was conservative talk. This radio. is yes, this it is. is. <laughs> yeah, well, so I, always, I put a sticker on my uh, on my leg here because well, last uh, time. I, I, I get cold, I get hot, and I pull up my my leg, and he was focusing on my leg, so I just sort of put a. Put a sticker putting on notes on it. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I, I don't know, Edward. I think you've been a Marin too long. Since. I think it's, it's getting kind of scary. What do we want to talk about second? Uh, I, uh, earning season and just the last half of the year. And also, you know, uh, a lot of people want to talk about this is being an election year and how do the markets typically act during that time. I, like that. Uh, I think it's also. Um, uh, what do you, you know, is housing really recovering? Do you see that? Not oh, so much Bay Area, yeah. but I mean nationwide, because I got to tell you, it was just in Phoenix. It's still uh, brutal. Miles <laughs> of unsold track houses. Well, well that's interesting you, you say that because um, I've not been to Phoenix recently, mm -hmm. but, and, and again, we should probably talk about this in a second, but mm -hmm. I've been told and I've read that it's the only MSA in America that's actually appreciated. Yeah, it's, Phoenix, off, it's off bottom from that, a statistical point of view. And, and that everyone I talk to who's investing out of state is all about Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix. Boy, I'll tell you, I've Las to, Vegas. I, right? I, I think it would depend on what type of houses they're buying, and uh, because I, I mean, I was just there, Mark, and and the people there. And, uh, and, and granted, I maybe it's where you invest in Phoenix it, neighborhood, just like here. I mean, you can yeah. You're it's, not it's, buy it's the flats of Oakland. Local. Forget it. You know, I mean, you can. You don't want to buy the flats of Oakland. Come on, I want to be where the Occupy people are. Yeah, I want to be, you know, I have my lively, my live entertainment. But the middle class neighborhoods of Oakland are on fire for some <laughs> flip activities. Well, wait, you mentioned about Occupy. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Wasn't there some guy who who was going around selling Occupy T-shirts? Well, they still do in the, in the Occupy. It's that's like, enterprising. Yeah. I, oh yeah, oh, I love you it. Love that's it. exactly <laughs> opposite of what these people are supposed to represent. But I right. perfect. <laughs> you know, someone should be out there selling lemonade. No, another thing, everyone selling amongst each other. That'd and be that's fun. Fun. It'd be great. Yeah, it'd be like a little like, micro economy. 
<laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah, that's how things uh, we're get gonna have to, Unfortunately, they're supposedly coming back out of the weather's turning ice. They, they do what they are doing in season. Oh, that's what I told yeah. Berkeley. They'll be back yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. it's not raining. Yeah, yeah well, it's not <laughs> raining. They're back out. That's. Uh, I'm still wondering what the specific goal. Of otherwise, they just being a, being an anarchist. You know, just, just they're pissed things. off that their little world <laughs> is not what they were told it was going to be. That, I mean, to be perfectly blunt, that's they're angry. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry that you, there's not a job waiting for you outside of college. I'm sorry that your parents told you how special you were and that you wouldn't have to compete. I'm sorry that all that came true. Because they all got trophies even though yeah, they lost in soccer. Yeah, no, seriously. But if you listen yeah. to them talk, yeah, I, I mean, we're joking about it, but seriously, guys, listen to them talk, and that is what you're hearing. It is, it's just being pissed off that they're not making a million dollars a year at 28 years old. That's yeah. what it's all about. Yeah, I came home with a second place trophy. My dad beat the crap out of me. No, <laughs> no and, and uh, or nothing. But it, it's, you let a girl beat you. <laughs> you know, I think um, the other Mark, you bring up a good point. Though. You know, embarrassing. I, I would. I think it'd be actually kind of fun to talk about why is California doing what it's doing? We are. We've got the best weather, the best beautiful place, and why our local politicians want to continue to keep caps on everything? Well, the question is just with George Lucas. Yeah, oh, I know. God, that's right? Right? You know, stupidest right? thing. Well, I, and like it's going to hurt also, housing. housing. Right. You have a Absolutely chance. Well. You know, exactly. so I, I, I wonder, you know, we talk about when's it going to recover. Is one of the politicians going to get out of the way yeah. and let yeah. things go? Because I actually think they're harming it. I think they're harming California real estate. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. I truly believe that. Well, it's harming business. It just it's harming business also harms real estate. But, uh, you know, from everything I read, George Lucas is, uh, you know, he's a very good neighbor, and he, yeah. I mean, he does all. He built a fire department out there, even. I know. Yeah, yeah. I guess he, he does. Well, what yeah. he look can at the to look at the look at the minor league ballpark. Look at the money it's going to bring to San Rafael. Look at the yeah. crap. Right. A, a, an already existing structure that was falling apart, and they wanted to worry about some little toad in the stream. You've got to be kidding yeah. me. Well, it, it's over, just, but over at uh, Lucas Valley, though, um, is it just the cars that they were worried about, or was it specifically some environmental? Environmental. Well, the, I, just front page, Novato Advance said it was all about the environmental uh, safeguards that they were going to impose on Lucas on Skywalker Ranch. Yeah. I remember over at French Ranch, someone said, uh, you remember the big thing about spotted owls? Mm -hmm. Well, back then, they didn't find a spotted owl on it, but they said, Two properties away, we saw a spotted owl. So that means on this property, you can't do anything. Oh, nice. Because it might fly by. It might fly by. <laughs> okay. But one lady, I mean, this is, this is a true story. God. Some lady got up, and because it was quoted word for word, and she said, you can't you know, go in front of the council. It says, you cannot build any houses on that property. Really? Why? Because, well, my son goes to the school, and if he's playing ball, and he looks over his left shoulder, he might see some houses, and that will be emotionally devastating for life. What? Oh, come Seriously, on. Seriously, yeah. that's a quote. Oh, yeah. my God. I'm thinking, and if I was at that meeting, I would have said, does he play in your own backyard? What does he do when he looks back at your in house? your house, <laughs> right. Exactly. Or after he's well. done playing ball, where does he go? Does he have like a... A log he sleeps under or yeah. something? Yeah. Or does he go to a house? You know, uh, Mark, another thing we probably talk about too. Ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Another thing to maybe talk about. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I will. I have a lot of clients. A lot of them are seriously thinking of leaving California. I mean, business owners. Oh we have service, yeah, the service, not manufacturing. The service people have enough. Yeah, I've had they enough. can do it anyway. Yeah, I can okay. do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And should we have a good um, uh, right after you go into the break? Uh -huh. say, uh, I can show guys the pattern about it. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, that's right. A good, a good yeah. second. Yeah. 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 He, what he has to do is he has to fill 56 minutes. And our, our really things are only minutes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's why it's good to talk about that sort of stuff. Okay, ready? Here we go. Here we go. That's all in the book. Okay, here we go. Well, welcome back to the Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hunt and Brian Burke. And when we kept to the first commercial break, we asked this trivia question: What was the name? What excuse me? What was the message the Wicked Witch of the West wrote in the sky? And remember, the theme is the Wizard of Oz. Anyone? Surrender Dorothy. <laughs> very good. Surrender Dorothy. <laughs> I knew he knew it. I saw yeah, the look yeah, on his face. Yeah, he's very, very good. We are in the studio here with Ken Winans, one, America, one of America's uh, premier uh, registered investment Thank advisors. Thank you. Appreciate it. You've won all kinds of awards, and you've got three books, and 
all that fun stuff and even let me write one page on it. Yeah, I'm much appreciated. Right. <laughs> well, I, I included trustees. It has to be included in any book on uh, the history of investing and hard money loans have been around for a long time and people need to know about it. And I even got uh, higher billing than Warren Buffett, but I think that's just because BR comes before BU. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, have a, I have a fair number of people say, why can't you take him out now? We don't like him anymore. He wants to raise our taxes. I said, eh, yeah, you know, yeah, still got it. It. All right. <laughs> So it's an election year. We got uh, Romney and Obama. It looks like. And mm -hmm. uh, what do you think uh, that that speaks for you know, the stock market going forward? What do, look, what do we get to look forward to possibly? Uh, you want the good news or the bad news? Both. At the same oh, time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Talk at both sides of your mouth. I want to hear that. All right. The, the, the good news is since 1833, the market, the stock market, the overall stock market is usually up 67 percent of the time, regardless of the outcome. That's the good news. The bad news is that it also depends on how the congressional and the Senate elections play out. Mm -hmm. If you have a complete one-party takeover of anything, uh, the following year particularly is not really good. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be very volatile this year. I think that as you start hearing the class warfare rhetoric that we're undoubtedly going to hear, uh, you start hearing talks about taxes, that hits near and dear to the heart of business people and investors, and you could start seeing some things change. The Obamacare issues, uh, whether or not that stays intact or changes, could affect people's decision on whether or not they have any health care stocks in their portfolio. So it's kind of, hey, strap uh, strap the seatbelts. It's going to be an interesting year. Well, wasn't, even, wasn't it even the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is usually pretty liberal, that just came down with a decision that said that uh, you can't force the workers to take their lunch break at a specific time? Do you remember reading about that? Wait, Edward, what left-leaning journals are you reading? <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> no, no, that was in that was in the Listen paper. Too much it, it got to the California. <laughs> no, actually, the California Supreme Court. It actually got the and uh, you know people. I guess it was a certain organizations uh, getting complaints that mm -hmm. you know, hey, you know, you're not, you're, you're, I have to take a, a break and it have to, it has to be this time and et cetera, et cetera. And it was like I was very pleasantly surprised that California Supreme Court struck that down. Well, nothing surprises me what happens in California because you know, I'll give you another example. Um, you've probably seen the, these Fannie Mae pools of bulk uh, foreclosed houses that they put out for bid. And uh, the California Attorney General has spoken out against this practice saying, well, you know, they, they shouldn't uh, sell these uh, pools of houses to investors. They should be selling them on the open market and, and this and that. Well, what they fail to realize is in that portfolio, 80% of those houses are occupied by tenants. And if you don't sell them to investors, you're going to displace hundreds of tenants in a very, very tight rental that's a great, market. That's a good point. So where are all those people going to go? So, you know, they're, they have this, this weird attitude about, about business, but yet at the same time, it interferes with the general public at large and their ability to just carry on their life. So it, this seems to be a common thing in California. What do you think about our California political situation? Uh, it, 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 well, an awe is probably the best way to do it. As a business owner, a resident, and I, 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 I love California. It's my home. So it's my I. ancestral home. I love this place. But it's painful to watch that it seems like our uh, local officials and the officials in Sacramento, um, whether or not they really get it, that they get the struggles that are going on right now. And I'm talking about the struggles as a business owner who's trying to keep their people employed, keeping them in health care, keeping them with 401ks when they retire. Um, they're making it less tempting to want to stay here. I mean, I'm hearing from a lot of my clients who run businesses. They're saying, I've had enough. I am honestly thinking about moving. Now, when you start talking about moving to Nevada or yeah, Oregon, you know, Every place has its issues. I mean, if you look at what's going on in those states, they've got problems too. But it, but it, it's when you hear things like this, it, it, it kind of, it's almost like government get out of the way and let things heal itself. It will get right. back to normal. Well, that's right. what uh, Warren G. Harding did back in the twenties uh, when he saw things going downhill, and he just said, you know what, the government should not come in and step in. Just let the free markets figure out where this, this belongs. Well, so government absolutely. intervention and government intrusion, it's just, it's endless. And what, what's amazing, it's, it's nothing new. It's been going on for 100 years. And, and in fact, uh, you know, the, the foreclosure crisis, so-called foreclosure crisis is, uh, you know, there's so many things going on with government intervention right now. It's one of the reasons why we don't, you know, everyone's wondering where's that second wave of foreclosure inventory. And it's, it's uh, um, uh, foreclosures are being postponed. And, and it's just, there's, uh, there's a lack of inventory out there for, for buyers uh, and sellers. It's just it's an amazingly strange uh, uh, environment and, and uh, real estate market we're in right now, and nobody really knows what's going on, other than the government uh, uh, keeps 
fiddling and meddling around with the with the situation. And, and I'll add to a part to that. Um, I I believe that we all know bankruptcy has been around for 140 years. It is a time-tested way to have organizations reset themselves. It's kind of an alt control delete. Let's get it back where it needs to be meaningful. Yeah. I get worried when the Sacramento somehow, because it, it is an election year, they're dependent on capital coming from their backers, that they're actually interfering with that process. I actually think it'd be better to let these municipalities go through the bankruptcy, let's get them set properly, let's get these over these budgets that are out of control, it would be better for everybody. And, but gotta keep those pensions in place, right? Oh, I'm not gonna go down that <laughs> path. I don't wanna be able to walk out of here and not have problems, <laughs> but uh, but seriously, no. But, but the sooner you rip the Band-Aid off and let these things heal, the sooner we can get back, that the state can unfold its potential. But unfortunately, guys, hey, we're, we all run businesses, we all know what it's like here. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I think it's still a stormy weather for California. Okay, okay. We're, we're not we're not a political show, right? But there is something that happened a few days ago that I just I felt like I had to bring up. Okay, because it has to do with free speech. Okay, uh, I gotta say that I don't like Ozzy Guillen as I, I didn't like him when he was a player, baseball player. I don't like him as a manager. I don't like him as a person. I don't like him, Sam. I am. However, whatever happened to free speech? Because if you remember, he was saying that he, re you know, he. He was not representing the uh, used to be Florida Marlins. Now it's called Miami Marlins. Mm -hmm. When he said that he respected Castro, Fidel Castro, right? It was just his personal opinion, and yet he got suspended for that. I mean, it'd be one thing if he says, you know, I, I'm representing the uh, Florida Mar or the Miami Marlins, and their position is such and such. All he's doing is just giving his personal opinion, and, which I don't agree with. I don't respect Castro either. But you know, the guy gets suspended from his job for just doing a personal opinion. I mean, what's next? He's not going to be able to uh, share his favorite cereal that it's Cocoa Puffs because there's not enough diversity in color. I mean, come on. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Edward, you would be shocked. When I do public lectures, um, you, you guys probably are familiar with the Dodd Frank Act. This was the government <laughs> remedy. <laughs> yeah, the, the government remedy to all those evil uh, people in, in financial service. Also known as Frank and Dodd. Yeah, Frank. Which, <laughs> yeah. It isn't funny that neither of them are around anymore. They've right? left. They've all retired as we, we're now the dealing with the aftermath. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what's interesting is you should see the disclaimer that now has to be read when I do public speaking. I mean, it takes a, a huge amount of time to basically tell people that you can lose money if you invest. Gee, that's a new concept. I had no that's idea. A, yeah, I thought the thing was guaranteed. But yeah. it, it's unbelievable what we've done. We and, and they've really never fixed the problem. I have long felt that if when you have state jurisdiction, federal jurisdiction, like I find it funny that look at insurance. Insurance is covered by states. Well, they've been saying that look, if you would unlock it so insurance carriers could, you know, basically sell their products across state lines. Healthcare costs would actually go down, but no, we leave it by state, by state, by state. Look at the look at the difference between look the four of us sitting here. I have to report to a different set of, of uh, regulatory bodies than you guys do. We all deal with the public. Uh, now that's just common sense. I but just yeah. report to my wife, but yeah. <laughs> she has the ultimate authority. But they have not fixed anything, and I would say that this country, if you had quit having Swiss cheese regulation, have level common sense stuff and you would have a lot of fraud disorder which by the way on this note isn't it funny that in california this bloated regulatory environment they actually now have it exempt for investment advisors who advise hedge funds of course oh isn't that funny yeah, the, the big the, the, is. the, yeah, yeah isn't it funny though oh no 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 leave them alone somebody had yeah. a good lobbyist yeah exactly. <laughs> that's exactly because it. they've never done anything dishonest well they used oh, to call it pork no. barrel politics now it's just pork regulation politics you get these like frank and dog was just really just <laughs> thousands and thousands of minuscule regulations most of which nobody who signed that into law were even aware of that we're only now discovering and the implications of it which most of which are not I mean, helpful who, to the public. Reads it? You know, I understood uh, from someone that Gray Davis actually read everything. That would be like reading the whole vehicle code, wouldn't it? It's probably got to be a thousand pages. <laughs> like who that. reads that but still drives a car? All right, guys, we're going to cut to our uh, second commercial break. Again, we're in the studio here with Ken Winans, uh, one of America's uh, premier trusted uh, registered, registered investment advisors. And um, you know what? I referred some business to him in the past, and those clients are very happy. So thank you very much. I'm glad to hear it. Okay, here's our uh, second trivia question. Who, again, these are a little bit harder now for the uh, Wizard of Oz. Okay, Mark, so far you're one for one. 
Brian, we're still waiting for NASCAR to show up in Wizard of Oz. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. right, yeah. Who was originally cast as the Tin Man just prior to Jack Haley, but had to quit because of an allergic reaction? You got your hand, you know that one? Yep, I do. Okay, because of an allergic reaction to the aluminum makeup, which nearly killed him. Yeah. The first three callers with the correct answer win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Again, their website is lighthouseforfun.com. Call 888-912-1190. That's 888-912-1190 to answer this question. Who was, origi who was originally cast as the Tin Man just prior to Jack Haley, who had to quit because of an allergic reaction to the aluminum makeup, which nearly killed him. Call 888-912-1190. Make sure to include your name, email address, and remember to spell out your email address one letter at a time for us. And people will know this guy. This is, this is not just some fly-by-night guy. No, right? he's very well known. Very well known, okay? And uh, we will be right back, and don't touch that dial. Excellent. Well, who was it? I'll uh, tell you a story about a man named Jed. Oh, well, out near the barely got his feeling. Wow. <laughs> but he had to like that. He had a bad job. Like in his final interviews, that he never got over it, ever in his entire life. He had a resentment about missing out on that opportunity. Yeah, yeah but it almost killed him. Once, yeah. So. yeah. So they would have yeah. found something. Mean, he just had an allergic reaction. Yeah. Oh, that's bizarre. Ever, yeah. hey, what do you want to cover the uh, next segment? Okay, we're going to get into email time, and oh, again, cool. feel free to, you know, cool, cool, yeah, jump cool. right in. Uh, let's see here. Yes, sir. That was an excellent uh, segment. Oh, that was amazing. That Head, uh, oh, headphones off, table. guys, so that uh, he can show that this is a break time. With what? With, with well, the whole thing with those, those pools of properties that were rented, and people need them to live in, and yeah. again, interference. It's unbelievable. It, yeah, we um, we actually registered to, uh, to bid on them. I've actually gotten to look at this pool and see what's in it. And... <coughs> These houses predominantly are occupied by tenants. Some of them are former owners that have signed on as a lease, mm -hmm. and some of them are tenants that were there renting the property before it went to foreclosure. Signed on a lease with the bank that now owns it? Uh huh. Okay, so they're renting from the bank. Right, renting from Fannie Mae. But Fannie, they, Fannie they, Mae they're saying they should be, you know, well, so here's what sold here, individually. So here's what happens to. the California Association <coughs> of Realtors issues a letter, an opinion letter, to the Attorney General and says, you know, we think this is bad for California's economy. They they can sell pools in Vegas or Phoenix, but they shouldn't do it in California. <laughs> we're different. Uh, so we're special. We're special. Yeah. So they said, you know, you shouldn't do that because inventories are tight and there's not enough housing out there as it is, and it's hard to, you know, you have buyer clients looking for houses and there's nothing to show them, and so on and so on. So they shouldn't do it here. So then the uh, attorney general makes an opinion, and this just came out a couple days ago, of a couple things. Number one, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac should halt all foreclosures and they shouldn't foreclose on anything. Right. In the absence of that, number two, uh, they shouldn't sell these pools of foreclosed homes because uh, doing that is taking these houses off of the open market. So that means two things happen. One, there's not enough houses out there for people to buy, and two, uh, Fannie Mae isn't going to get the highest price for the house, which is going to therefore cost the taxpayers more money. And number three, you know that it, that makes it challenging for the the public at large because these houses are being sold off and bought to the big investor, right? Yeah. But they fail to realize the whole impact of what happens if you take so the LA pool. Let's just say there's 500 houses in there, and that's approximately how many are there. You got 400 tenants. Where are they going to go if all of a sudden, en masse, they say, all right, everybody out, we're going to sell these houses to first-time home buyers. Uh, well, they won't sell them to the, to the tenants. Yeah, yeah. Right, or maybe right. the tenants can't qualify or don't wish to buy them. No, they'll, go, they'll, they'll do stated income again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And they'll give them a funny right. loan right. and yeah, no, sure. no money down. <laughs> but where would all of those people go if they don't sell these houses to the occupied back? tenants? Because the houses, when Fannie Mae takes a house back, if it's owner occupied or vacant, they can either have the owner move or take the vacant house and put it out on the open market and resell. And that's in fact exactly what they do. The houses that landed themselves in this pool of homes predominantly were houses that were rented to bona fide tenants pre foreclosure. So rather than kick the tenants out, they kind of just threw them all in a bucket. And now here we are, fast forward a couple of years, they've got 2,400 and change houses in this bucket that they need to sell, and they're tenant-occupied. So they still don't want to make these people move, but yet regulatory 
bodies are coming in and saying, oh, well, you shouldn't do that. Can't sell them in bulk. Yeah, you, don't, you shouldn't sell them in bulk. That's yeah. not right. Yeah. Well, these tenants need a place yeah. to live. Well, you sure you know, you're not worried? You're part of the one percenters. You know what part? Of, you know what some of it might be coming down to if somehow I'm just I'm thinking in the terms of, of these cash-starved counties. If they somehow are not getting their full water property tax, maybe that's also they're saying like we need to get owners back in here, owner occupied, and anyway, just follow yeah, the money trail. But but, okay. but but if they do it to an investor, he'll pay the property. Tax. Okay, yeah. Well, what and, is it, but and is you it guarantee they're going to pay it. The homeowner may or not pay it. But look at it this way. Okay, so. The, the county says, let's sell this house to an owner occupant so we can collect property tax rather than selling them off in bulk. But I think that that works counter to their interest because if they sell these in bulk and those in fact aren't quote on the open market, mm -hmm. that does tighten inventory. Tighten inventory leads to rising prices. Rising prices lead to higher property taxes. And they'll put rent control in for everybody. Well, when you, when you look at the... I mean, <laughs> That's the solution. At, yeah, no. right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> look at the financial underlying metrics. I mean, these houses... Okay, so take a house in the Imperial Valley of California, it's 3,000 square feet and it's worth $175,000, but it would cost you $300,000 to build that house. Yeah, but would you even build it there to begin with? No, you wouldn't now. <laughs> no, but, but, you, but the point is, is that you could it. Work $4 Economically, you can't. So that down. price has to increase before any additional supply can come into the market. That's right. Okay. You guys ready? Yeah. And by the way, I'd love to talk to you guys about uh, when uh, uh, Association of Realtors basically falsified their sales figures for five years. Right. I'd love to bring oh, that up. Yeah. Why there's not a, an investigation. That In my business, that's called fraud. Yeah, yeah and they, yeah, then they just, but it's called marketing in the other. Yeah, yeah marketing, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and the chief economist still has his job. That's the part that I find amazing. Yeah, probably got a raise. Yeah, right? I got a Harvard-educated guy who doctored the numbers. Right. It's pretty fun. Okay, you guys ready? Ready. Okay, we'll get into uh, email time. Welcome back to the Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hoff of Pacific Private Money and Brian Burke of Praxis Capital. And when we cut to the second commercial break, we ask this trivia question. Again, the theme is The Wizard of Oz. Who was originally cast as the Tin Man just prior to Jack Haley, but had to quit because of an allergic reaction to the aluminum makeup which nearly killed him? And Mark, say it for us. <laughs> well, that was a man named, also known as a man named Jed. That was Buddy Epson. That was Buddy Epson. You know, I, 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 heard, I read an article about him or an interview later in life. He never got over that, that he missed that opportunity. Well, that's too bad. Uh, yeah, because actually he's a very good dancer, but he actually did a lot better on, on the Beverly Hillbillies uh, with that. Yeah. Okay. Here, we are going to jump right into email time. Uh, Brian, we got one here for you. When you buy a home in foreclosure, how do you inspect the property? And give us a little background. Well, I'll tell you how I inspect it. I mean, it, it, for the background, Edward, uh, many many of our listeners may or may not know that uh, I'm the managing director of Praxis Capital. We're a, a real estate private equity firm based in Sonoma County, uh, California. and. Uh, our, our business focus has always been the uh, purchase of distressed real estate, whether single family properties, multifamily apartment complexes, and, and whatever. There's, there's always been some element of distress in the real estate market, even when uh, its outward appearance, it would appear to be very healthy. Uh, so right now, obviously, the opportunity in real estate is in purchasing distressed homes in states such as California, Arizona, Nevada, and Florida, although I, I question how much economic sense it makes to buy anything in Vegas, Phoenix, or Florida, but in California it certainly seems to make sense. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that you, you've got to do in a foreclosure situation, obviously uh, the houses aren't maintained in top shape like they would be uh, typically, so you've got to be very careful. And, you know, we buy at two different uh, venues, so to speak. So we're we buy houses directly from uh, from banks when they're listed on the market as REOs, and typically uh, the ones that we're going to buy are going to need a lot of work. If the house is in really good condition, a first-time home buyer is going to buy that. Uh, but sometimes you have houses where the, the kitchen has been stolen on the way out the door, or uh, you know it hasn't been maintained in years, and or, or they're down to the studs. I mean, I can tell you all kinds of oh, stories. Oh yeah, we had one where we could go on all day. In the apartment, they actually took the toilet paper holder. Yeah, oh yeah, oh, that's, that's, <laughs> but I've heard other stories. You've actually had houses with the toilet paper holders still there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how well, about things like wire and copper pipe? Oh, yeah, right. oh, yeah, yeah we've, we've all seen the that time. too. Oh, absolutely. But I, I've also heard on the flip side, there's actually been people who've like been seen vacuuming the rug. We've had that, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. The vacuuming and cleaning on the way, and and, uh, and leave the keys on a nail next to the front door. We we've, we've had all of that, uh, you know. And, and some people uh, do it differently. And you know, we usually end up with our houses in pretty good shape because if they're occupied when we take over, you know, we treat the people very very well, and consequently they they leave the house in really good condition. But as far as the inspections, uh, if we're buying a house from the bank, then we go in and actually inspect the house, crawl underneath. Uh, we'll have inspectors. Uh, check out the uh, the condition of the roof and the, the wood and everything. If we're buying at the auction, it's a bit more challenging because you don't have the ability to do these types of inspections. So you basically, we're just kind of a walk, it, it's walk a curbside by, yeah. uh, drive by, and, and we just take a really good look. And after doing this for 20 years, uh, we've gotten really really good at it. Okay, you can you know see how good the bones are from the outside. Well, I can tell you if you look at a front door and the front door is dirty, I can almost guarantee you the inside of the house is pretty dirty too. It's just it, well, it, just little yeah. things that you see and, and you start to notice trends. You don't, you don't just bring a white glove with you and start kind of going. I haven't the tried that yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we received, let, let me get into email time here for Mark. Mark, we received an email for you. It's almost along the same kind of lines. Uh, what due diligence do you do when a fix and flip borrower comes to you? So this is obviously from an email of, of someone who's listened for a long time. So anyway, my company is uh, Pacific Private Money. I'm uh, the broker for that company. We do mostly loans to real estate investors in the Bay Area. So in fact, most of our loan applications in the last year, I would say 70%, maybe even 75%, if I check the latest numbers, are from individuals who are looking to buy, fix, and flip in this market. And you know, notwithstanding what you may or may not be reading in the newspapers about uh, the fix and flip, activity and opportunities, there are a vast number of, of real estate investors out there that are in fact um, repositioning you know, non-producing and non-productive real estate by going in there doing extensive remodels and putting it back uh, on the market uh, as like new turnkey property. And so um, what we do is when uh, we, we like to work with experienced um, rehabbers uh, as opposed to people coming, you know, straight out of a you know real estate boot camp and like the idea of making money in real estate, we generally have a lot of repeat uh, rehabber clients, and so what we do generally is we tour with them first to see what projects they've done to look at the quality of their work, and of course we also do due diligence like uh, collecting a, a complete loan application. We do a credit report and background check. Um, we usually suggest that when they provide their application to us if they put together a kind of a, uh, uh, a qualification or credibility package that shows a spreadsheet of their prior projects and such. So so bottom line is is that we work with people who know how to make money in this market because it, it, is, it is a tight market for making profits because prices generally are not increasing right now uh, and the supply is short which means um, it's hard to, harder to find a really good deal. All of that notwithstanding, we still have applicants that are really good at finding property, uh, particularly property that uh, maybe uh, hasn't been remodeled in a long time, yeah. or maybe never. Like for example, one of the hottest markets in the Bay Area right now is Oakland, where there was an awful lot of housing developed in the 1940s and yeah. 50s, and I can't tell you how many homes I walk into that had the original kitchen and bathrooms, yeah. Yeah. and yet they were lost in foreclosure because the people who had lived in them before were using it like an ATM machine and refinancing and refinancing and refinancing and getting maybe three, four, five hundred thousand dollars worth of debt accumulated on these properties that now are trading at maybe one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand. Well, those properties, when uh, when a rehabber goes in and maybe takes it down to the studs and puts in uh, new copper and uh, new plumbing and electrical and and uh, maybe restucco the outside. You know, those you can turn around and sell those properties then for four hundred to four hundred fifty thousand dollars and make well, a pretty decent profit if you know what you're doing. So your your due diligence is very similar to what a bank would do. Yes. But I'm guessing it's probably a little better because you're probably smarter than the average banker. Well, we're not bean counters at our company. I mean, I've been in real estate now in May. It's thirty years since I first went to work in in the development uh, real estate development uh, industry in 1982. So. Uh, and everyone on my staff uh, owns real estate. We're all real estate investors. So uh, the banks are generally, for lack of a better term, bean counters. They're really looking, you know, they're looking out uh, for their job first and foremost. So, so at this point, do you have too much investor money and you're looking for deals? What right now the market thing? is, yeah, right now the market in private money lending or hard money lending, as some people refer to, in the Bay Area, 
there's a tremendous amount of wealth in the barrier, as, as most of us know. And so yes, we have way more capital right now. Uh, we have access to way more capital now than we have deals. So the scales are definitely tilted in uh, we're, we're, and those of us in this industry are beating the bushes for, for good lenders. Okay, yeah. and what kind of rates are you giving those borrowers with, who have decent deals? Well, the cost of private money is, hasn't dropped that much. It still can be, particularly short-term fix and flip money, where they only need the money for 6 to 12 months. Um, you're, you're talking about 11 12% for the cost of the money. And then the, the investor is getting uh, generally 1% below the note rate. So well, if it's only a 6 to 12 month loan, it's not that big a deal to the borrower whether we pay 9% or 11%. It, it doesn't, it's not that much of a difference no. from no, a it's, dollar perspective. No, it's, it's more um, reliability of the money because oftentimes what's happening is the guy who wins the, um, the bid on a property uh, is the guy who says, I can close in 10 days, yeah. all cash, or no, no cash, no closing contingencies because they know they got you know, Pacific private money in their back pocket who can pretty much fund in you know, three to five business days if we need to. And do they have to pay you a, a fee to hold that money? Uh, a fee to hold the money? Yeah, like, you know, to where they say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guarantee that I'm going to get this deal done, but I've got to make sure that you are going to fund the, fund the deal. Well, no, it's just that we have so much capital that it's, it's almost never a problem for us to find okay. a lender. And actually, we do have a fund right now, so we can, oh. we can close in 48 hours. So for so more information, yeah. you can go to PacificPrivateMoney.com. That's PacificPrivateMoney.com. Or, of course, go to our radio show website, TheBestOfInvesting.com. That's right. And, Brian, uh, how do people get a hold of you if they want to invest in foreclosures? Uh, they can uh, go to our website, it's www.praxcap.com, which is P-R-A-X-C-A-P.com. And Ken, we forgot to uh, ask how people could get a hold of you. You're still in the, oh, in the studio. Here. I was so amazed listening to these two guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm kind of, uh, uh, it's uh, two ways. And if you're looking for my books and all that, it's Ken Winans, W-I-N-A-N-S.com, or the name of my company, Winans International. And uh, certainly the website is a, as it's spelled. Very good. All right, we're going to cut to our third and final commercial break, and here is the trivia question. Again, the theme is The Wizard of Oz. This one, I think, is a little easier. What was Dorothy's last name? The first three callers, oh, we may have stopped Dorothy. <laughs> I see the grin there. The first three callers with the correct answer win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Their website, again, is lighthouse4fun.com. Call 888-912-1190. That's 888-912-1190 to answer this question. What was Dorothy's last name? Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. And it's not from The Wizard of Oz. It, 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 that's not her last name. It's not Oz? It's not Oz. Oz. I, I yeah, Dorothy Oz, too, Oz. Yeah. Well, between her and The Wizard, yeah, yeah, we don't know. Okay, make sure to include your name, address, email address. And again, please spell out your email address one letter at a time for us and speak slowly. And don't touch that dial because we will be right back. Hey. Awesome. Anyone know the answer to that one? Nope. I don't. Aha! I want to use a lifeline. Dorothy Smith? <laughs> Dorothy Smith! I was like, no! <laughs> Dorothy, Dorothy Hamilton? Dorothy Hamilton! <laughs> no, Tim. Oh, no. Dorothy <laughs> Am I close? <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> what state is she from? You guys were in the state? <laughs> Kansas. Well, that one. Yeah. Dorothy okay, Kansas? <laughs> Dorothy, Dorothy no, Garland. Kansas. What? Garland. Dorothy Gartland. Dorothy, 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 yeah. <laughs> Dorothy Judy Gartland. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Mark, I'm curious. Yeah. What, uh, what, right now, what are you guys finding? Are, have the appraisers learned from their past mistakes? Are they getting reasonable now? Are they still pie in the sky? I mean, you know, it depends. I'm, the commercial appraisals, I'm, some of them I'm seeing are just like stupid. They're really yeah. still stupid? Yeah, they're just, yeah. What, what, it's, well, they just don't know what they're doing? or. No but it's, you know, it's some are good. Sometimes they'll, you know, like, well, if one comes in with that's cap rate based, but they're not paying attention to the fact that the price per square foot that they're claiming the property is worth well, is just not supported. Yeah. Like I had that happen here, actually here in San Rafael. There's a building in the professional area on Mark Drive where there's Mark and Paul. There's every other building in that entire park has a four lease sign in front of it. So, yet. <laughs> This one building that happens to be 100% occupied, and that 100% occupancy is is mostly artist studios. So this guy did something oh. pretty clever. Yeah. But they tried you, based on a seven and a half cap rate. They were telling me the appraisal that said it's worth 1.6 million bucks, or $200 per square foot, and they're not moving at 150 bucks per square foot. So you know that's. 
the, on the housing side, though, I am seeing. Well, here's my some problem. With, here's my problem with appraisers on the housing side. <laughs> They're afraid of their own shadow. So we'll take yeah. a house and we'll run through and totally fix it up. Granite yeah. counters, new countertops, new bathrooms, new roof, windows, carpet, the whole nine yards. And then the appraisal comes back and they're using comps of an REO without a kitchen. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, and a house that <laughs> a short sale that sold with tons of deferred maintenance mm -hmm. that you look at the interior pictures and it looked like a pack rat house. And that's what they're using as or our a comps. Or a meth lab or something. And, and at the same time, yeah. we've got three offers at full price. And we're the only one that's not a short yeah. sale REO or wrecked on the market within a you know a half mile radius. So you're right. That's actually been it's the pendulum has swung the other way. Where yeah. We're actually seeing fewer appraisals actually come to agreement with an arm's length transaction really? for my rehabbers who are looking to exit out of our loan and sell the property. Or like for us, we we had this house. We uh, we got it in contract. We had multiple offers. Uh, the buyer came in, got the appraisal, the appraisal came in low, so they wanted us to lower the price. We said, no, go get another lender. Well, they couldn't do that, so that buyer falls out. Buyer number two comes in, same price, they go to their lender, they get an appraisal, it appraises at value. So here, these poor people didn't get the house that they wanted because some appraiser that they've never met in their life that they paid $250 to wiped out their chance to buy that house. Right. And somebody so else who had a different still appraisal. screwing up the market just in a yeah. different way now. You know, yeah. the, the, the other thing we're hearing is we're, I'm up in the country club area in Novato, and there's just not a lot of stuff that, there's not activity. Yeah. And so the appraiser right. said, well, there's no comps. Well, you know what? And so what they've done is they've stretched into areas that have yeah. nothing to yeah. do with where we live. Right. Nothing. Right. So it's like, what is, back, is it better to go back in time and go, when's the last one? You if know, it was four years ago? You I know? told our banker, and I know this, this is a novel concept, but the banks need to look at the total relationship. Like in our case, look, I own 92% of my business. My business has grown for 20 years. We're at record levels. You know, my wife is going to be an heiress one day. So if the appraisal on the house is a little low, you guys might want to look at the entire relationship yeah, yeah, right. and say, hey, wait a minute here. These are not a bad bet. But the banks are so compartmentalized. You guys know this. They're yeah. so compartmentalized. Yeah. The private bankers don't deal with people who do the loans. Right. They don't even talk. Right. So yeah. it's just, it gets to be ridiculous. But the reason I was asking is that um, a lot of my guys that were doing private money before, they're so gun shy and they got burned so badly. Yeah. It's like they, and they have, and their disdain is at the appraisals. Yep. Mm -hmm. They said, I will only do it if it's. 40% loan to value. Yeah. I want it so I've got a 60% buffer because I don't trust those bastards. Yeah. But that's you know how bad it's gone. Now is yeah. the time when it would be probably safer to make a 90% to value loan now than a 60% oh, to value loan in 2005. They don't think the, the fallout's good. That's like we talked about. They don't, yeah. the second it's round of foreclosures, done. they don't think the fallout's done yet. That's yeah, the problem. I, I know that they think that, but there's just no economic justification of that opinion when you have, when it's cheaper to buy a house than to rent the same house, and it's one third of the cost to build the same house. Yeah. The thesis for downward price uh, movement well, is getting weaker area. by the day. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you have it going well, that's, but, but I think we'd agree that the thesis for it going up in value, you've got a long way down the pipe. It's before not going to happen. Let's yeah. pray for yeah. inflation. Yeah. 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 What do you want to cover in the last eight minutes? Uh, yeah, yeah, some of the stuff we're just talking about. Can you had mentioned something earlier? I'm forgetting now what I used to do. Well, I want to. Well, I'd like to. I'd like to talk about the trumped-up sales numbers from the Association of Realtors. Oh, right. I'd That's like it. to know how you guys, oh, as real okay. estate professionals, yeah. feel so about I'll that. Come right in and say, "Can you have a great question?" Yeah. Okay. okay. You guys, ready? Yep. Okay. Here okay. we go. Welcome back to the Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hoff of Pacific Private Money and Brian Burke of Praxis Capital. And we kept a third commercial break. We asked this trivia question. Again, the theme is The Wizard of Oz. What was Dorothy's last name? Mark? No, I don't know. Don't know. Uh, Regis, can I use a lifeline? I can tell my <laughs> wife. She, she likes this movie. Uh oh. And... Ken, you thought it was Garland. Garland. No, that is not correct. Her name was Dorothy Gale. Oh, of course. Of course. Oh, come come on. on, Mark. Why didn't we get that? Yeah, you got to watch more TV. Okay, and more movies. Ken, you, had, you were going to come up with an excellent question for these guys. Go ahead. Well, knowing that you guys are the pros in real estate, I just want to know how you all feel about the Association of Realtors functionally pumping the number, the sales figures up for the last five years, coming out last December and saying, uh, the numbers have been wrong by, uh, I think they say 14%. It was some 
huge number, which if that happened on Wall Street, man, someone would have lost their job yeah, and probably called, be in jail right now. It's called marketing. It's called, you got to get the next well, sale. They also call it propaganda. But what, I mean, were you guys shocked by this? I'm just curious. Were you surprised? That they, I wasn't surprised in the least because it, part of the problem that contributed to this is that uh, there's multiple MLSs, and so they're counting a sold property that might have been in two different MLSs as being sold twice when really it was once. So it didn't surprise me at, at all. Well, and they've, you know, I think the feeling is is they've really been a mouthpiece for the interests of the realtors. And the interests of the realtors is to have uh, a rising market and product to sell. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's, uh, it's, it's disappointing, that's for sure. Yep. So it's kind of the old uh, yeah, question the data. You know, yeah. hey, hey, by the way, it brings up an interesting point. We have entered a world in the in the financial service area, uh, at least what I'm seeing. Data is coming out 24-7 constantly on the internet, but nobody's filtering it anymore. I mean, we're, what people used to think was news could be nothing more than rumor or hearsay. And it's a struggle because if people are gonna take action based on unfiltered information, they're going to make bad investment moves. Well, and we were just talking off the air that you went to visit, Ken, you went to visit Phoenix, and you said you saw the neighborhoods that just had rows and rows of foreclosed homes, and made a comment about, you know, that's a, that, that is a market that's still uh, uh, declining, and yet I hear anecdotally guys who are saying, oh, Phoenix is the market to, to invest in. And that I've even seen statistics that have, that have borne that right, out as well. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah. right. There are statistics that are saying that uh, Phoenix is one of the only MSAs in the country that has actually seen price appreciation at a certain level. So, uh, it, you know, it must really be just like everything else, a neighborhood by neighborhood analysis. I mean, even, the, even in the Bay Area, you can't generalize about how real estate is doing because, I mean, look what's happening in Silicon Valley. I mean, it's just, you got a, you've got price appreciation uh, that's off the charts. You have impossibly high rents, and yet you just go down 880 a little bit to uh, to Oakland, and prices in some markets are still declining. Well, I remember being on Wilshire Boulevard in uh, LA, and I was in a really good area, and then I was on a bus one time, and suddenly, Wilshire Boulevard is not an <laughs> excellent area, the whole street. It so. changes, doesn't it? It sure does. I learned that really quickly. You know, when uh, you go to different areas of the country, and I find it, and, and we probably do the same thing with other areas as well, they say the Bay Area. Well, the Bay Area is as different as night and day when you go to various areas. I mean, sure. what does Marin County have to do with Oakland? Very little. I mean, they're very, very different areas. Good and bad. I'm not trying to, I mean, I, I love Marin County, as you guys do, it's a great area, but Marin County is not San Francisco. Marin County is not Humboldt County, and yet people somehow in other parts of Bay Area, Bay Area, it's, it's just vanilla. It's all yeah, the same. You hear that the yeah, well, you do. And I'm sure Phoenix isn't just Phoenix. Exactly. You know? That's why I think that's the point too. Can you give us a prediction for the uh, Dow in 2012? Hey, you're going to love this. I did a radio interview. At the, uh, it was a station down in, in L.A. They asked me for my prediction, and, I, and I, you know, I do a lot of quantitative work, and I just say, look, if the market had a historical, just a normal run, law of average, just like the same thing you'd use in baseball. Hey, if a batter hits an average of 325 for five years, you assume, okay, I'm going to assume he's going to do it again. I picked the number 1422 on the S&P 500. And I'm just, that's what the computer said. Well, guess what the latest high was on the S&P 500? 1422. This is the part that's interesting. Lucky guess. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, there's a little luck in everything. Right. But, but this is what's interesting. Is the moral of the story is is that we've hit that number in three months. Mm -hmm. So it, it there's a lot of optimism built into things right now. And I'm not, hey, we all know about Apple. But hey, look, there's optimism in Nike, Costco, uh, a lot of different areas. My worry is that I think people have forgotten that the economy is still very fragile. And you could come up with a lot of things that could affect it in a bad way. Um, what What about Europe? What about if Europe gets worse, which is sure. one of our big export markets? That could affect us. That hey, what happens if China slows down? What's the What effect does that have on California? Well, you've also been a big technical guy with mm -hmm. like the two hundred day moving average and all that. Oh, that's all uptrend. Everything is that is but all very much in an uptrend. Yeah. But I worry when people take oh. Well, the market was up 12% in the first quarter, so I'm just going to assume that the market is going to be up 48% by the end of the year. Hey, wait, wait, you know, guys, because, because this is not the dot com. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. Yeah, but <laughs> I, 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 physics don't work I think what goes up must come down, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Edward, I you can't forget that about that. Okay, <laughs> I, I'm on record on this. I do think the easy money, any buy anything and watch it go up, I think that's ended. This earnings season is going to be very telling. 
if, if earnings are generally okay, you have room that this thing can continue to run. But I think it's going to be, hey, like I said before, put on your safety belts because I do think you're going to see some good, bad, and ugly for this earnings season. Well, and if Nancy Pelosi is right and she thinks the you know, Democrats are going to retake the House and Obama gets reelected, uh, and you've got the Democrats in control, and what's that going to do for uh, well, like you said, hey, 2014? Go, go look at my book, Investment Atlas. It's a history book of what, how the financial markets react, and when you have capital gains rates, Go above 30%, yeah. the investment market is flattened out. Okay. Because at that point, it's too much. It's, it costs too much to invest. All right, and that All leads right. us to our thoughts for the day. Again, Ken Winans from Winans International. Thank you for much. Very thank much you for having us. me. It's always All been right. fun to we'll see you guys. Great great show. That's right. We'll definitely have to have you on again. Yeah, it was a very good show. All right, thoughts for the day. Uh, do you do you have any idea how cheap stocks were in 2009? Wall Street is, was being called Walmart Street. And uh, Mark, <laughs> right. you you have a dog, right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, listen, if he doesn't understand rollover, try first introducing him to an IRA transfer. But I'm oh. <laughs> like Okay. Tune in next week to the best of investing. We're going to be giving away nine more free vacations for answering trivia questions. Our guest next week will be a very special friend of mine, Paul Kingsman, who won the bronze medal in the 1988 Olympics. You won't want to miss it. He's going to describe one of the most exciting finishes in Olympic history. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm Edward Brown. Wishing you the best of investing. So long.